Um, so I, I saw your pictures from your Valentine's uh, <laughs> day. And in case our listeners don't understand, please explain what you did. Okay. So um, if you've never seen Letter Kenny, you should stop <laughs> this podcast and go watch it. And then come back to us. And then come right back to us. Uh, but like episode maybe two or three, it's very early in it. Uh, they throw a super soft birthday party for one of the characters. And it's like, essentially, it's the most girly princess birthday party ever for this grown man. Because <laughs> uh, it's a tradition. Because it's a tradition and you don't fuck with tradition. Right. Um, so for Valentine's Day this year, Michael had has been dealing with um, some uh, dental surgery. He actually might, he, he's probably as long as the weather holds up, going to be going back in for more dental surgery tomorrow. Um, and so uh, for Valentine's this year, I threw him a super soft Valentine's <laughs> Day. Uh, and it was really funny because he came out and was like, what is this? <laughs> He just couldn't stop laughing at me. He goes, he's like, it's because I don't have any teeth. <laughs> but he ended up loving it, right? Oh, yeah. He absolutely loved it. He wants to do it every year with Hazel. He just thought it was a great idea. So it was like really cute. I did like cotton candy and champagne glasses. And so we had sh cotton candy, champagne and like, you know, cupcakes and Pegasus and unicorn, everything. <laughs> and like, he wore like a little princess crown the whole time. And, I like, love it. A lot. And, uh, um, so, but then I also served like all soft food. So for the appetizers, we had stuffed mushrooms and baked brie. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I made lobster mac and cheese for dinner. Oh my so God. Mac and cheese. Yeah. Hazel was digging the mac and cheese. She was just like, mm, the whole she time. liked it. Yeah. And she actually had some of the leftovers for dinner tonight. And she just like, loves it. So. Girl after my own heart. Yeah. Love mac and, and cheese. And then we had a uh, unicorn ice cream and cupcakes and chocolate covered strawberries for dessert. Amazing. It was amazing. So we had such a good time. It was so fun. He was very, very, surprised and excited that's amazing new tradition we have officially decided and chosen how and when i'm going to school <gasps> yes so um i believe it starts in march i have to confirm with it but i'm going to be going full time <gasps> oh my god yeah, so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, are you going online? Or are you going to go? It'll to be, it's it's going to be online. They uh, they did offer both at the one I'm going to, but right now they're doing just online. But it's like live classes online. Oh, that's awesome! Congratulations! I'm very excited. Uh, I want to get completely signed up. And then I'm going to be like, okay, job. So here's what's happening. <laughs> oh my God. That's so exciting. I'm yeah. so happy for you. That's so awesome. I'm really excited to be in an atmosphere where I'll be in a class and have other people that are in the class with me. Yeah. Um, and it's like from 9am to or like 9.30, I think to like 3.30 for eight weeks or nine weeks. Oh my gosh. So yeah. that's like a real life school. <laughs> it is. And I'm really <laughs> excited. And um, I've got a, my cousin-in-law, who has been so helpful, I've been such a pain in the ass, like constantly texting her, like, can you look at my code? And <laughs> but she's been nothing but absolutely helpful and sweet. And she, um, uh, like, she just got out of surgery. So I'm like leaving her alone for a couple of days. But she's nice. <laughs> she's, like, she's like, let me know once you get out of, you know, like once you get a couple, like get this thing in. I'll help you get on LinkedIn. I'll, I'll get everything set up. She's like, I'll get you a job right away. You'll, you'll Dang, be that's awesome. Very excited. I'm that very is awesome. Excited. Yeah. So I'm so proud of you. I'm so <laughs> proud of you. Well, now that we've got the, those uh, fun things, life things out of the way, this is Revolution Rosies. Hi, I'm Vivian hi. Vega. <laughs> I'm Betty LaRue. And um, yeah, so let's go ahead and get started on the, um, Second portion of building an empire, correct? Yes. All right. When you have built empires. All right. So I will start off with a news story. It's going to be very brief, um, but um, 
Wow, I really built an ambiance here, didn't I? Yeah, this is gorgeous. That's how I was like, man. Completely accidental. It's um, really beautiful. It's, Mine's very plain as it normally is because of the way I'm like, I could try to like tilt it up to my family, like thing up there. Family, ooh, that looks nice. It's like a Thanks. gallery. Yeah, no, this like, is like oh, I just have like a <laughs> lava lamp over there and then I have like leg lamp. It just looks like I it planned it, but I, colors are great. Yeah. You look gorgeous in the light that you've got going on. I well, didn't mean to get that. To like, I didn't mean for that to happen either. I went, this has itching, but my hair is really greasy. So that's why I didn't know you were going to wear last time. No, that's oh. this guy. Look how nice this is. Oh, that's a cute <gasps> girl. Is right? that a Charlotte Bruce hat? Cause I have that. No, it's target. <laughs> I have that hat, almost exactly that hat. It Isn't is my, it? like, whenever I want to feel witchy and sexy, it's that hat. Right? It's the best hat. But I, I hat. it doesn't work with these. So. No. Um, all right. So, news story. Um, so, um, I typed everything out. So, I'm very prepared. It's right okay. here. So, if I'm looking over here, I apologize. No, um, so, um, two very smart women are at the forefront of studying the COVID-19 pandemic in Africa right now. Um, Raki, and I'm probably not going to pronounce their name correctly, but Raki Baldi from Senegal and Tatenda Zinyemba, Zinyemba from Zimbabwe are both focusing their attention on co the COVID-19 studies in Africa, and they're helping to promote the need for more females in the pivotal roles in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics fields, which is STEM, yes. um, because there are very few. Very few. So few. Um, so I'm hoping to enter the field. Exactly right. Yeah, it leads in really nicely. <laughs> it was completely accidental, folks. Um, women hold less senior positions than men in universities, and women uh, oh, and fewer women are majoring in these studies as a result. So, um, because there are fewer women as professors, On top. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that of course means fewer women are like. Hey, I want to do that. Like, you know, representation. Um, it it ha absolutely, it matters. Um, it has been shown that the COVID pandemic has widened the gap even further with closing um, of more labs while simultaneously increasing the responsibility of women in the workplaces that are currently open. So not saying that more men are quitting per se, but... That's kind of what's happening. More women are staying in those labs while more men are either going off somewhere else or leaving altogether while women are staying and increasing their job duties. Um, so on February 11th, um, so just a few days ago from when we're recording this, which was just so happened to be International Day of Women and Girls in Science, which is a very awesome. specific day <laughs> to be awesome. noted. I didn't know that that was a day. Let's all put that on our calendar. I know. I didn't know that either. Um, the website that I got this information from, which was unric, U-N-R-I-C dot org, interviewed um, the two women I'm talking about, Raki and Tatenda, um, on why they wanted to do this and become scientists and it really came down to the enjoyment of the subject and representation in the field and um yeah just like we said earlier representation matters you know, i mean like when you see people that look like you doing it you're like i can do that too like, absolutely. absolutely it matters so much yeah absolutely yeah i mean especially african women and yeah. women from you know, Senegal, I'm sure, you know, I don't know how common it is for the Zimbabwe and Senegal, but I know here it's not very common either. Nowhere, nowhere it's common. Um, how, did you have a science teacher that was a woman? I did. You did? I, I did. Didn't. Actually, my high school biology teacher was female. I'm trying to think. I don't think I did even in college. Yeah. My high school biology teacher was female. I'm trying to think of my science teacher in junior high was also female. I think I had a math teacher that was a woman. I had, let's see, my English teacher was 
So all except for history were women in my junior high. So, but I grew up in a very small school. So it was like four teachers. I had like my math, science, um, English, and uh, um, history teacher for junior high. And all three, except for America, except for the history teacher was male or was female. And so my science teacher and my math teacher uh, were both female. And then in high school, my biology teacher was female. And I'm trying wow. to think if any of my high school teachers, other than that, other I than had a English, lot of high school male teachers, all like most of my male teacher or my high school teachers were male. To be honest, most of my teachers in high school were female. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Like, that's... I didn't have a lot of male teachers. Oh my God, I had too many, I would say. <laughs> I. Thinking about it, I like I said, I had one in junior high, um, and then I had more in high school, most definitely. But like, yeah, no, art, biology, and I think I feel like she taught. Well, no, because Mr. Schopstall was chemistry, so I had a male chemistry teacher in high school. But biology was female, art was female, um, Spanish was female. Um, most of my math teachers in high school, all of my like social studies uh, and uh, history teachers were all male. Mm -hmm. but that seems like a subject they would flock to, I would say. I had an amazing American history teacher. He was the older brother of one of my classmates and he was awesome. To this day, he, he is the one that really got me into looking at history as, you know, um, as living as like, being lived through rather than mm. something that's happened. So yeah, that's amazing. nice. So that's that was nice. great. Anyways, I'm sorry. I'm no, fine. you're fine. That's fine. I don't care. Um, that's what this podcast is. Sister. <laughs> um, last thing about this, um, when being interviewed about women in science, the U UN United Nations security general, um, Antonio Gutierrez said women and girls belong in science, yet stereotypes have steered them away from science related fields. It's time to recognize the, that greater diversity fosters greater in innovation. What would NASA be without women? Uh, we already we did that podcast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what would NASA be without women? What would like, you know, and I, the I joke about it often, but like a lot of times, <laughs> I know it's so silly. It has nothing really to do with uh, women in science, but I look at my daughter sometimes and I'm like, the secret to youth is in the female utera. <laughs> yeah. Like my body knows how to produce brand new cells. It just won't do it for me anymore. <laughs> right. Gives it all to those little hellions running around. <laughs> um, but no, women really, I mean, like women belong in math and science. Absolutely. I mean, just, it's like your favorite thing to learn about i do love i'm such a numbers nerd i know that's and not me it's like puzzles they're like puzzles i me. love puzzles but i wish that i had gotten more into it in high school i wish that there was more you know like hey what did we just husband, learn from martha stewart though it, you can start anything at any so, age she was 40 when she, she was i know when she started doing so her it's life. fine you're doing yeah. it you're doing it now you're doing um, it now if you don't mind, I have a quote um, that was shared on Twitter by Amanda Gorman, who I don't feel like we've talked about enough on the podcast. Okay. Uh, uh, Amanda Gorman being the poet from yes, yes. the uh, inauguration, who is just amazing. And I amazing. love her. We, yeah. we didn't even talk about her during the last time. We I just, what is our problem? Because we waited so long afterwards. Like we, we you're right. Like it, it she, First of all, you know, like she was just amazing. Like I sat and we, we even talked about it. Like I sat and I just like cried watching the whole thing and she was just amazing. And then um, she did the Super Bowl opening. Um, but she, she's just, so, I didn't watch that because I don't, I, I didn't watch that. I did catch some of hers. Um, and then, you know, I follow her on Twitter and I, um, and I'm watching just like watching her interact with people, whether and her, She's just so like, I don't know, she's so sweet and young in 26 or 20, 22. She's very young. She's very <laughs> young. Um, and just watching people just like 
bond over her and she's yeah. just like, oh my god Lynn manuel Miranda is talking to me on Twitter <laughs> it is so fucking cute so anyways um she said she uh this is a quote from her from uh Twitter because I did I realized I was like god how did we not talk about Amanda Gorman we talked about like everything else I know um, so she said self-love is revolutionary we cannot fight for others when we're fighting a war inside ourselves. Compassion is a power that we first bestow on ourselves and then give away through our actions to people, to our planet. When we recognize this, that is when love becomes our legacy. Wow. Gosh. Uh, the youth. She's brilliant. I'm yeah, she's brilliant. And I just love her. Love the freaking her. Freaking youth. I tell you. Yeah. Anyways, I, I, like I said, I realized we didn't really talk about her. And yeah. I read, can you, you know, send me that quote? I'm going to um, make it into something pretty. Yes. So yes, yes. Our thing. Um, I'll have to find a better screenshot of it. because I was trying to screenshot it as Hazel was, oh, she was rough to get down tonight. <laughs> um, and so as she's like climbing all over me and nursing on me, I'm trying to take a screenshot of it. And I act in UFT is the volume button. So it's got a picture of my body. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'll send you something better. Okay, oh. that's fine. Thank she you. It was so hard to get down tonight. I'm sorry I wanted to get on here earlier. but It's okay. Be- Winston doesn't have school tomorrow. It just got canceled, so. I'm wondering if work will get canceled tomorrow. He's uh, My job sent everyone home at 3 today. I was already home because I got I worked on Saturday, so I had the day off. Woohoo! Yeah. Um, I have to work, but I'm already at home. Right. <laughs> um, so if I get a job from home. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to go ahead and ease into my story. So this is, you're going to have to read between the lines as to how this person built an empire. Okay. Because technically did not build an empire, but if you look between the lines, she did. Okay. I'm sure. I'm sure she's got an amazing empire. You, I'm well, you know that I never follow the rules. That's fine, which is why we're going to be breaking the rules. We're going to break the rules from now on. But um, this was a request from my husband, actually, to do this person. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, he actually had requested me to do another person, Polly Shore's mom, actually, um, who I'm not doing. But she owned um, the um, comedy barn in... Um, uh, California. What was her name? Um, hold on one second. Mitzi Shore. Mitzi! Yeah. So, right. Mitzi Shore is her name. And uh, she was who I was going to do because she owned, uh, she co-founded the, the comedy store, which is like where all of, all of the comedians that you like right. know, Robin Williams, Whoopi Goldberg, Roseanne Barr, Gary Shandling, Jay Leno, David Letterman, Chevy Chase, Sam Kennison, Mark Marin, everybody, Jim Carrey. That's where they all got started. But no, I'm not going to do her <laughs> because I'm going to do this person who okay. was another person that he was like, you should do her one day. I was like, okay. okay. And it's got a sponsor. This is gum from the 1970s that's awesome that isn't you have it, that sponsor isn't that weird it's discontinued and i found it when i went through my uncle's stuff he died in 1973 and it's adam's sour cherry gum with extra flavor yeah and it's 10 cents a packet Yep, eight sticks. Just in case you don't know that it's from the seventies, right? <laughs> like it's, a, it's this glorious, and I'm gonna I'm gonna give a description for those who are listening and not watching. It is um, by the Warner Lambert Company, made in the USA. Back when gum was American. Made of gum base, sugar, corn syrup, artificial and natural flavors, and artificial color. Yeah. Sounds about right. Right. So I'll post a picture of it because isn't that trippy as heck? It's really gorgeous too. I know. I can't it's, stop. Like I, I haven't, it's unopened. It reminds me of when I go and I get like, I love getting um, birch. What is it? The pink one, the birch bubble gum. I've never heard of that. And clove, birch and clove bubble gum. They, mm. they have not changed their like packaging since like 
I would say the sixties and no one, but my family chews them. Oh my gosh. The birch tastes a little bit like you're chewing Pepto, if I remember correctly. Mm. And the other one, clove. I like clove. Yeah. Um, But yeah, so it's sponsored by gum from the seventies. So this is going to take you back. So this is about Marsha Lucas is her name. Okay. So Marsha Lee, she was born Marsha Lee Griffith, born in Modesto, California on October 4th, 1945. Her parents divorced when she was just two years old and her mother um, moved her and her family to North Hollywood, um, then to Florida and then back to Hollywood by the time she was in high school. Um, after high school, wow, she Florida att- to, did you say Florida to Hollywood, right? Yes. So <laughs> they, they lived in California Mm-hmm. Modesto, which is close to Hollywood, I think. Yeah. And then lived in North Hollywood. Then she moved um, the family to Florida to be with her, the mom, like her grandpa, Marsha's dad. Then he died. Then they moved back to Hollywood when she was in high school. Quite a move, but it's all nice and sunny and by the ocean. Yeah, they obviously don't like to be in the north <laughs> where we are right now because it's awful i don't blame them um so after high school she attended los angeles city college to study chemistry another woman of science um and she studied there at night while she worked during the day as a banker to support her family um i don't i don't know what her mom was doing or why she had to i don't i don't know the story Whatever. Anyways, by 1964, she was dating a guy. I didn't get much information about this, but he worked at a film museum because it was Hollywood. (laughs) So that's what it is. If you're not in the movies, you work for the movies. Right. Unless you're a banker, I guess. (laughs) Well, I mean, people have to put their Hollywood funds somewhere. You got to put the money somewhere. Put all that movie money, please. (laughs) Exactly right. Um, And she, um, and he tried to get her a job as a librarian at the film museum um, to catalog donated movie memorabilia, which sounds fucking fun as shit. Yes, that sounds like it would be delightful. I mean, in at 1964, like you would have all those Sorry. like classic movies. Oh, it's okay. It's just Frankie playing, isn't it? I know she's got a toy that's really. Ah. <laughs> she's trying to get attention. <laughs> but anyways, so she applied for the job, but instead of getting that job, she ended up getting hired at this company called Sandler Films, where she um, started as an apprentice film librarian. Um, so still the same job, kind of, but at this other film agency. Um, and she ended up working her way up really, really quickly um, and becoming an assistant editor by the age of 20 years old. Wow. Like, that's not even what she went to school for. That's no. not what she got the job for. No. And she was just, only 20. Like, that's really yeah. working your way up. Yeah. She was just ambitious and was like... I'm going to not be a librarian forever. Like (laughs) I'm going to do this instead. (laughs) Anyways, she was really, really good. And she ended up um, working um, alongside a woman named Verna Fields, who I was like, why is her name highlighted on Wikipedia? It sounds familiar. Okay. Well, she worked at Sandler Films, obviously. Um, She was an editor. And again, women in this field not super popular of of a job. Um, And she, Verna um, was actually an editor for movies that you may have heard of like American Graffiti and Jaws. I feel like I've heard her name too. Like, yeah. 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 She's like, she looks old and mean, but she probably got the job done. (laughs) Like Like maybe she was uh, a, character in that like Hollywood TV show that came out on Netflix this summer that wasn't very it wasn't accurate at all but it was good oh I I think that you and Sheree both told me about that show it wasn't accurate at all but it was fun it was beautiful and I'll I take like I'll, I'll take a look at it and see her character may have maybe that's why I've heard of her she may have been like characterized in that yeah maybe I mean she oh. was 
Yeah, she was very um, popular in the scene. Um, so in 1967, um, Verna actually asked for an assistant to help her with a new government funded documentary. And um, they sent a few her way. Some were students. Um, and one of these um, was, um, one of these assistants was Marsha. Um, and then the other was George Lucas, who you may have heard of. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> so George Lucas wasn't George Lucas yet. He was just a student. Right. Yeah. So Marsha at the time um, ended up attending University of Southern California to study editing because she's like, okay, bye chemistry. I don't need you anymore. I guess I'll study something I'm actually gonna do. Right. Yeah. Um, I, mean, like, I think that wasn't Martha Stewart chemistry. And then she went to like, yeah, yeah. She started chemistry too. You're yeah. right. I didn't even put that together until just this moment. And then um, George was also attending the University of Southern California. So they knew each other from that class. And then they started working together side by side with, you know, Verna doing the editing. So um, while she was working on editing projects at Sandler Films, she was also practicing editing work while editing commercials and getting paid for them. So she was going to school for editing, working for Verna and doing the commercials. So she was like an editing, like fool. She's just constantly, constantly and cutting. Like, and again, that's not, that's not like clickety, clickety, clack, clack. Oh that no. Was, they had to cut the film and like, yeah, paste it together and like old school. Yeah. Um, and right. so in 1968, um, while she was still in college, she and George were asked to accompany Francis Ford Coppola to help scout locations for the rain people um, in Long Island, New York. Um, and then this is where Francis Ford Coppola and George Lucas became like super close buddies. But um, he, Francis Ford Coppola also grew close with Marsha and loved her skill. So um, then um, when they started working together with Verna, her and George became super duper close as you do. And then as you may see by her last name, they ended up getting married in 1969. I know where this is going and I don't know much about the woman, but I'm very excited. Yeah. You're going to get really excited. <laughs> I did know a bit about what you're going to talk about, but not like the whole story. You're going to get really excited and then maybe not as excited <laughs> really fast like really fast. It's like a roller coaster. <laughs> okay. Okay. So in 1971, like you're going to celebrate her like, ah, and then you're going to go, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a thrill. Okay. So in 1971, Marsha worked as an assistant editor on a film called THX III 38, which is a sci-fi thriller written and directed by George Lucas and produced by Francis Ford Coppola. Sounds like it would be awesome, right? Right. That sounds like it should be great. Right. And Marsha was like, um, I don't know. <laughs> like, it sounds kind of awful. This oh. sounds kind of bad. And I don't think that it's going to be a good, a good flick. Like, and he was like, well, you're going to help me edit it and you're going to like it. And, okay. and, um, it was a flop and it was a fucking failure. And um, George even said to her, um, this is where you're going to get just frustrated with him. But he said to me, I was stupid and knew nothing because I was just a Valley girl and he was the intellectual. Yeah. No, I know that through this whole thing, I'm going to hate Luke. <laughs> Yeah. Like, I know that for a fact, because I yeah. already know that from her story <laughs> that I know, the part of her story I know. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it gets, yeah. Um, it gets worse. Oh, yeah. Um, so after graduating from college, by the way, she hasn't even graduated from college yet. So and at, yeah. 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 And like, yeah. Yeah. So after graduating from college, um, Marsha becomes a badass in the editing uh, field, and um, she just keeps on getting asked to do work, even after that massive failure. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, Wikipedia also says that Marsha assisted with, America, uh, with editing American Graffiti in 73, but she um, 
was not credited. Yeah, I think I knew that. Yeah, I'm you're gonna sure. find you're gonna find that a lot actually. Yes. yes. Um, <clears throat> if you see George Lucas's name on things, you're usually not gonna see her. Her story is one of that where her husband erased her. Oh yes. Oh yes, it is. Yes, it is. But you know who didn't erase her? Martin Scorsese, this little charming, tiny little man. Okay. <laughs> so Mr. Big Eyebrows comes in. <laughs> They're so big. <laughs> um, he's so little and those are so big. But anyways, so a young Martin Scorsese, Scorsese, Scorsese. Anyways, he comes in and he asks her to edit a film Alice doesn't live here anymore. And then um, uh, she was named supervisor or supervising editor. Hi, sweetie. Um, supervising editor of his next two films after that, Taxi Driver and New York, New York. I don't know if I've heard of any of those films. You've not even seen Taxi Driver? Very much kidding. First of all, I haven't seen them, but Alice. Okay. I was like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> well, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore is actually a very big cult classic movie. And then Taxi All Drive. of them are, really. Yeah, really, really, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was all her, all of it, all of it. Um, and it gives me goosebumps because, like, he had so much faith in her to be like, I want her on all of it. Oh, yeah. Um, she was nominated for an Academy Award for her work on Taxi Driver. So this is like her very first big thing on her own. And yeah. she gets nominated for an Academy what? Award. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? I know. Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to yawn. It's fine. Uh, Sandra Weintraub. Um, which was an associate producer for Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, um, also an actress in a soap opera. Um, <laughs> I don't know. That was just something I tossed in there for you. Um, stated that she, w that was the 70s for you, I guess. It was like, you can do that stuff, act in a soap opera, and also be an associate producer for f major films. <laughs> I really think you can do that nowadays, too. I don't I know. Like Are soap, soap operas opera. a big deal now? I mean, a lot of people get their starts there still, I think. It's not General Hospital or anything, but still. Maybe. Yeah, people get, like, little starts on soap opera. I guess. I, I always think that about Disney shows. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Disney There's shows are the new soap operas. <laughs> they really are. Yeah. No, I, I see that. They, they, Anyways, they old Sandra Weintraub says she was a wonderful editor working on her husband's films. I don't think she got taken seriously. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely true. Right. Um, because she always got like credited for his stuff. Like she was like, oh, she's just George, George Lucas's Lucas. wife. Oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's frustrating. Oh, yeah. Um, so while George Lucas was writing Star Wars, Marsha was giving helpful input um, that would ultimately, ultimately end up in the film and changed the entire film completely for the better because it all yes. stayed in and changed yes. everything. Um, I and would what say- I heard What he wrote originally was shit. Yeah, garbage, mm -hmm. garbage. What um, he just ask what Mark Hamill. Ever since. Yeah, exactly, uh, yeah. My husband good sense, just saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so um, anyway, so like, um, I don't think at this point I'm giving any spoiler alerts away. The movies were made in the 70s. <laughs> yeah, right. right? Okay, so, like, um, she was the one who suggested that Obi-Wan should die during the battle. He had him staying alive, but she was like, don't you think it would be, like, more vital if he was, like, a Bigger spirit state. guide? Yeah. You know, like, and, like, it would be, like, a shock, and people would be like, what? You know? Did and, you expect him to be in all of the movies? He's like the, right, know, the main right. character. Yeah, she's like, people would be more shocked by that. So you should add that. Um, she is the one who um, had the Luke and Leah kiss in. She's like, we should have them kiss because that would be weird, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, like, she also gave um, Chewbacca his very first <laughs> sound. Like, that wasn't even in the film. And they're like, silent. like, 
what? How? Like, so, I mean, that's insane. Like all of these things were added because of her input and that's just crazy. All of Uh, these iconic things. Yeah. Like these things that people are like so used to knowing about, you know? Um, And she began editing the first Star Wars, um, A New Hope, episode four, along with the two after. Um, So in 1977, she left working on the film to finish work um, on New York, New York, after the original editor had died. So she wasn't the original editor of New York, New York. But Martin Scorsese was like, I love you. Please help me. (laughs) My editor died. So great on these other things. Can you please help me? With please this? help me. I got an old dead. Guy. I know you're in the middle of something, but could you please? <laughs> right. Um, he doesn't really like you. I do. Please help. Um, so she and the other two editors of episode five, Paul Hirsch and Richard Chu, won an Academy Award for best film editing um, for episode five. For all those star swipes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so on, uh, they, they did all the editing swipes, you know, Oh, that's uh, what Star Wars is known for is their swipe screen. Oh, the, you mean the excellent transitions? <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. And it's so Star Wars and no other movie can do that without it looking like, re- like, just- you know what? I do appreciate that the Mandalorian has been doing those kind of transitions too. Have to. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really like franchise of movies that have ever been able to, Oh, really? <laughs> oh, re- tell me about it, Hazel. Tell me. Um, she agrees. That was her agreeing with you. Um, so she was also editor, as I mentioned, for episode five and episode six um, of Star Wars. In 1981, though, Marsha and George adopted Amanda um, after several failed pregnancies. Um, and she took a break from editing to help complete what they called the Skywalker Ranch, which is their movie ranch and workplace. Um, I want a movie ranch and workplace. I know, right? Like, damn. I want something called the Skywalker Ranch. Um, anyways, <clears throat> it's really cool looking. It's very big. I mean, um, that was the thing in those days was to, like, build a ranch to live on. Like who else did it on a ranch that you were like, why the fuck are you on a ranch? Oh gosh. It's a woman that like you would never expect to end up on a ranch. You keep going. I'll try to remember her. Okay. Okay. Um, As she was close friends with Steven Spielberg, she got a first look at the first Indiana Jones. It was one of your women. Edie Sedgwick. No, she lived on a ranch. It's one of your recent, more recent women. Continue. Um, So she was friends with Steven Spielberg and she got a first look at the first Indiana Jones film, which was Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, And George also wrote that. Um, And guess what? He didn't do a great job at writing that either. So she had to change some things about that up too. And Steven Spielberg listened because she had great ideas and she ended up changing the ending of it. um, And he listened and he changed it to what she said instead of what, fucking George said, because she is a woman and had a better idea for it and had like a romantic conclusion where it ended like a nice ending should end instead of a dangling. Yeah. Like (laughs) weird. It's almost like the George Lucas written movies stopped being good after their four. Just which does happen. Sorry. (laughs) <laughs> so, no, it does happen. Um, by mid-1982, she was fed up with George calling her stupid and his emotional blockage. And she asked for a divorce. <laughs> it's the very but next for her. But he, guess what? He straight up said, we should wait until Return of the Jedi comes out until we go public with this. Because my feelings are more important. <laughs> my movies. My movies. I also want to be able to blame it on you if it's not good. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, mm-hmm. But of course it was good. So yeah. Um, by 1983, they announced their divorce and she won $50 million, but lost like a freaking, like all of her freaking credits in yeah. movie, movie editing and any He's creative like, credits on you anything. You with me anymore. I'm going to erase you. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, anything that she ever gave him any ideas for, he never mentions. Um mm-hmm. 
And then I say here, um, she said, he never gave me much credit. When we were finishing Jedi, George told me he thought I was a pretty good editor. In the 16 years of us being together, I think that was the only time he complimented me. What a dick. What a dick. And like I said, uh, since their breakup, mm-hmm. not, what's he done that's been any good? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> he had to take over. Yeah. Like, seriously. Mm-hmm. It's, it's crazy. Um, and then Mark Hamill. He ruined his franchise. Oh, absolutely. Mark Hamill claims that her editing advice saved the, the whole Star Wars franchise. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Like, for real. Like, he, he mentions time and time again, like, Marsha was the heart behind Star Wars. Yeah. Um, soon after the divorce, she remarried Tom Rodriguez, who actually was friends with George Lucas. Um, and he was a stained glass artist. And they had a baby named Amy. And they lived mostly out of the spotlight. She only ended up doing two movies after that. Really? Yeah. Like one in like late eighties and one in like 96 or something. Um, she's still alive. Um, just. You should come out and start editing movies again. We could use some more keen eyes. I know, man. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be some shit if she did some Mandalorian episodes? <laughs> oh shit. Wouldn't that be some shit? Be some shit. Oh, damn. I just, that made me. I have to say that I really love that you chose this for building an empire. Right? I think it's beautiful. I love that you've done both Star Wars women, um, which is funny because you would expect that from me, but not you. Yeah. (laughs) Well, my husband is a big fan, so. Um, But Marsha was uncredited for her work on both Empire Strikes Back and American Graffiti, though many say that Marsha was the heart and soul behind both of these films. What have you done? (laughs) So that's why I chose her for Building an Empire, because she was uncredited for Empire Strikes Back. Let me back a little bit more, and then... uh... Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm ruining nope. everything. You're not ruining everything. But that is uh, the story of Marsha Lucas and the unsung hero of Star Wars and George Lucas is a dick. That was such a good story. Hazel, can you clap? Can you clap? <laughs> she's rubbing her eyes like she's sleepy. Oh, no, she's totally tired. She's just refusing to sleep. She is so silly. She's a cutie pie, though. Oh, she, that is a fact. All right, so, I'm going to give her back to daddy. I was, thought she would be cute, but she decided that she didn't want to be cute for mommy's podcast. So that is it. That is my woman. That was amazing. Thank Great you. story. Uh, like you. I said, I, I really love that you chose that for building an empire because I feel like you've done something very full circle here. Yes. Um, I love the play on words. <laughs> uh, the empire I, uh, straight that. back. Oh, and a story that needs told. Like when I oh, found out that story, like it makes perfect sense too, because everything he's touched since then, including including the Indiana Jones sh- franchise, has mm-hmm. been sucked. Yeah, and there's a reason for that. Yeah, he's yeah. behind every amazing sci-fi man is actually a woman. Going, the story makes no fucking sense. <laughs> And sure, she could wear a gold bikini for one fucking shot, but for Christ's sake, yeah. Seriously, women belong in sci-fi, women belong in science. Absolutely. And editing. And editing. (laughs) Me too. She had to edit that man. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so that is, that is my lady for building an empire. Strikes back. I'm I'm very, very happy with that story. That was great. (laughs) Thanks so much. But um, yeah, so um, next month, we're just starting our free for all. I'm super excited. I am too. No rules. Just right. I'm just going to go through some of the women that maybe I'd like put down and been like, I don't know. Let me tell you, I have got mine already locked and loaded and I can't wait. Then it's going to be a complete surprise where we're not like, oh, I know. It's just gonna be a complete surprise. I'm so excited. Ah, I know. I'm so excited too. Okay. Well, don't forget to we forgot to do this last time, but I did put it at the end of my YouTube video. Don't forget to like and subscribe and comment and send us your women that you want to hear about. 
check us out at Revolution Rosies um, on Facebook. You can send us all of your women and everything on revolutionrosies at gmail.com. Uh, you can follow us on uh, Twitter at Revolution Rosies, R O S E Y S. Nope, uh, it's uh, R O S Y S. There we go. Sorry. Start it's okay. Off. It is all weird. And then we're also on Instagram at Revolution Rosies. You can see pictures of our episodes and some yes. extra fun stuff that you're amazing at sharing. Oh, thank you so much. I'm sorry. I did like the teaser for uh, today's episode. Thank you. Yes, we are going to start releasing shorts. Um, so if you like bite-sized chunks of our episodes, um, we will be starting to release bite-sized episodes as well um, on YouTube, as well as on our Instagram and Facebook as well. So yeah, that is that. That's enough of us. Thank you yeah. so much for listening. We love you so very much. So very much. Thanks for being here. Um, we want to say, oh, give a shout out to Sabrina um, for talking about us on the Columbus Murderinos. <gasps> yes, we got a shout out. On you know, thank you so much for sharing this. Yeah, um, and, and telling people to listen. We appreciate that so much because honestly, like, Talking about badass women um, has been one of the most uplifting things I've got to do in the last three years. Oh, yeah. Um, and I realize how much I enjoy listening to podcasts about people just talking about awesome things that they're excited about. So, like, I want people to listen to us because that's what we do. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. I, I can only listen to talk about flowers so much, you know, because that's what I listen to. Is like I'm listening to uh, You're Wrong About. Oh, oh, I follow, I, I follow a TikToker that has a podcast and she's from Scotland and um, she talks about like all these people who um, are not who you think, I think is what she's, it, it's called. And oh my gosh, not who you think you are or something. And she's got this cute little Scottish accent and she talks about like how bad Mother Teresa is and like, oh, it's so great. That's great. It, that sounds a lot like you're wrong about, which you're wrong about is about just like historic events that you know absolutely nothing about because Ugh. they were they were portrayed as this thing and they've been like you know Love that had to be this thing throughout history and then it's like actually oh that sounds good all right so, all if right. you have podcast recommendations send them our way too <laughs> but yeah. we really want to hear about the women you want to talk about so send yeah. those our way too because we want to shout them out and now you so don't bad. have to worry about you know sticking to a certain thing we're just going to talk about women so if you have a woman you can just throw her in there and yeah you don't need to never know next week it could be yours yes all right until next time smear lipstick and raise hell bye bye, bye.